Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's J by J program, Pissed Off the Fight for Gender Equity in Politics and Sports. Tonight's event is the first of two International Women's Month events presented by JYJ. Come back next Monday for a Q&A on the new documentary, Ruth Justice Ginsburg in Her Own Words, available to stream at jxjdc.org. Unfortunately, tonight's moderator, Susan Stamberg, sends her apologies for not being able to join us, uh, but I'd like to take a moment to introduce tonight's panel, starting with Christine Brennan, an award-winning national sports columnist for USA Today, commentator for CNN, ABC News, PBS NewsHour, and National Public Radio, as well as a best-selling author and a nationally known speaker. Also joining us tonight is Sharon Pratt. Sharon Pratt was mayor of the District of Columbia from 1991 to 1995, being the first female leader of the nation's capital and the first African-American woman to serve as a mayor of a major US city. She is also the founding director of the Institute of Politics, Policy, and History. Finally, we are joined by Aviva. Aviva Kempner is a filmmaker and DC statehood advocate. She makes films that investigate non-stereotypical non images of Jews in history and celebrate the untold stories of Jewish heroes. A work in progress preview of her upcoming documentary, Pissed Off, and her newly launched initi initiative, so, so, Sports Equality for Women, sets a scene for tonight's conversation. If you would like to ask questions during the conversation, please put them in Zoom's Q&A box. Now I'm gonna play a quick three minute clip from the upcoming documentary, Pissed Off, before we pass it to the panel. There was no women's restroom because there were only men who were architects. And when we said, you know, you don't have a women's restroom on the red carpet, they said, oh, we didn't think of it. It finally became the Congresswoman's suite because uh, there are women in Congress and no restroom anywhere for them to use. Women and girls are disadvantaged by design. Even in the U.S. Capitol, until recently, Congress women and women senators were forced to use restrooms far away from the House and Senate floors, causing some to miss important votes. It is glaring. It is inconvenient. It is enormously inefficient. And it's downright unfair. All we want to make sure is that those who do want to attend to their needs are able to do so uh, equally with men who have the same needs. And last time I heard, men and women really do have the same needs in this one sphere. morning, we, for the first time, had a traffic jam in the women's senator's bathroom. <laughs> it's never, it's never happened. There were five women in there. There's only two stalls, and I'm not going to say who. That would be really bad for decorum. But there were five of us in there, two newly elected. Uh, so it's very exciting. So you know things a, are good for women in politics uh, when there's a queue in the restroom. Indeed, given the logistics associated with the restroom ritual, true parity would probably require two to one ratio of toilets for women to men.
Well, welcome to Women's International Day. And I especially wanted to have this program tonight at the J because I always had launch my films or tonight uh, the website and uh, the three minute sort of trailer of the film. And it's exciting to also have Christine Brennan and Sharon Pratt here because they're both friends as, as well as women I respect so much and they're both in my films. Um, I just wanna talk a little about how I came to make these films. You know, as Alex just uh, introduced me, I traditionally have made films about underknown Jewish heroes. But ever since making the film on Gertrude Berg and You Who Mrs. Go Goldberg, I've been wanting to do another feminist role model. And it turns out the two issues came up in the two areas that really are very dear to my heart. One is politics, of course. And I was at a discussion uh, uh, of The Wrap, which is a Hollywood website started by Sharon Waxman. And I was a discussion there and it was actually the Senator from Minnesota was talking that said, you know, we used to not, we used to have to run to go to the bathroom. We couldn't do it right off the Senate side. And if you remember hidden figures, that's exactly what these senators were going through. And actually on the way they had to face lobbyists and tourists on the way who would you know, bother them and they might miss a vote. So of course in Hidden Figures, it was racism. In the US Senate, it was of course the issue of exclusionary architecture. Now of being a certain age, although this was also true when I was young, I always say I have the smallest bladder this side of the Mississippi. And when I'm in California, I have the smallest bladder that side of the Mississippi. And I could not imagine what it meant to be that you couldn't go to the bathroom just you know between votes. So I decided I had to go make this film. I also think that you know there's a lot of serious topics in life, but at least this one could could have some humor in it. Um, but what's amazing to me is it took 200 years for them finally to get bathrooms uh, for the Senate side, and then. Uh, and now, just now for the House of Representatives, they were able to get that um, uh, some years later. Now, what's really happened is exactly what was said, is there are not enough bathrooms. We have 26 women in the Senate, and we have 118 in the House of Representatives. And if we count Eleanor Holmes Norton, which hopefully very soon will be a voting member of Congress, because of course I'm a big statehood advocate, um, that, you know, they will have to increase it. And one thing I haven't even investigated is what is, I, what is our vice president groundbreaking Kamala Harris do in terms of going to the bathroom? So I welcome all of you who are listening either tonight to give me stories of potty parody, to write them to our email, because I know in early baseball stadiums, there weren't, I know for sports, for sports, female sports writers, there was a problem. I know RBG talks about in the Supreme Court, there were no bathrooms by the court and we could go on and on and on. So I hope you go to the pissedofffilm.org website and if you can make a charitable donation. But the other issue for me is really sports. And traditionally it's been baseball. As you know, I've made two baseball movies and that's baseball is my one sport. But as I started reading the sports page, I realized that I was reading more and more articles because of course I was reading it for Imagining the Indians, which is a film about uh, the insidious use of Native American mascotting in sport, a film that we've, uh, that we've interviewed Christine Brennan in. And I realized that almost every page, there was a new story of either a woman accomplishing like they always do great records um, advancing the glass ceiling, ceiling in terms of ownership, in terms of being a referee, and sadly, a lot of stories about Me Too stories. And I kept on sending the articles to friends and I thought, you know, this is crazy. In, in working on Imagine the Indian and talking about how the Washington football team had to change their name, we realized the, we started a feminist caucus, those of us who are female um, working on the film, and we realized that really there was an intersection between the racism of the mascotting and the sexism. And sure enough, there's, you know, developed the whole scandal of the cheerleaders here in Washington, but it's in many, many sports. So 
in working on that, we decided to start S-E-W-O-M-E-N, So, so Women, which is a, a clearinghouse for stories about women in sports, their aspirations, equality, and the inequity, as well as an archive for them for future use. So um, please read, today is really the first day it's live. Go to the website and you can read what I and a diverse group of women uh, decided to write, uh, to develop this website, the reasons we did it. Um, as I say in the story is years ago, I was on a TV show, in, I believe it was in Toronto, talking about Hank Greenberg, talking about baseball back then. And as I walked off, one of the guys said to the other guy, Boy, she knows a lot about baseball for abroad. Well, it's many dec decades later, but I feel like the So website is my revenge. And when you look at the colors of the website, you know, our symbol, uh, purple, white, and gold, is the colors of the suffragettes. So uh, I think it's my turn to uh, turn it over to Christine Brennan, who um, is in our timeline in So. And she can talk about the, the advancements and still challenges of women in the sports arena today. And then we'll turn it over to Sharon, who you know is um, a great democratic leader and has continued to advance the study of many things at UDC. So take it away. Well, thank you. Thank you, Aviva. And it's great to be here with you and Sharon. So, so nice to be with you as well. And Aviva, thank you for for all you're doing and, and this new website, uh, Sports Equality for Women, I believe, or the, is the SEW, right? And um, that's just wonderful. And, and you know, it's, um, and, and whoever's out there, I know we can't see you, but you can see us. And, and uh, it's so good to be with you here this evening. And of course, as we celebrate women in our society and, and the advancement of women in the United States and around the world, it's truly extraordinary. I mean, today is the greatest day to be a woman in the United States until tomorrow. <laughs> and then the next day and the next day. I mean, we are really, really uh, doing some amazing, watching some amazing things happen. Uh, and, and sports has really taken the lead. Um, you know, Title IX was signed by Richard Nixon in June of 1972. That's the law that opened the, the floodgates uh, for women and girls playing sports. It mandated proportional representation for women and girls uh, in sports. Really started more as a, a law to look at our law schools and our med schools. If you're receiving federal funding, you need to be giving women the same opportunity as men. But it turned into a law that is, of course, completely synonymous with sports. And, and of course, more recently, the issue of sexual assault on campus as well. Title IX is used in that very important way. But, but uh, when you think about it, your, your daughters, your granddaughters, the girl next door, uh, your, your wives, your uh, sisters, um, they are playing sports as never before. And, Frankly, um, they are becoming better people because of it. You know, it's great to create Olympians and, and Olympic gold medalists and professional athletes from Title IX, but the real success story is participation and allowing the other half of our, of our population, the 51% that had been ignored for decades, who were told, no, you cannot play sports. No, you cannot learn how to win at a young age. Even more important, no, you cannot learn how to lose at a young age teamwork, sportsmanship, all those life lessons that will make us all better people and always and have made us better people. We were not giving those life lessons to 50, 51% of our nation. What in the world were we thinking? Well, now we are, and we're already seeing it. You know, Aviva, you mentioned the number of women in Congress. Many of those women, especially the women in their 30s, 40s, maybe even early 50s, um, were their, their courage, their discipline, their confidence was forged by playing little kids soccer when they were five, six, and seven, and softball, and, and lacrosse, and volleyball, and basketball. And that's my story, playing six sports in high school, not because I was so good, but back then no one really wanted girls to specialize, so I played everything, and my father was my own personal Title IX, uh, throwing the baseball with me, and cheering on the Toledo Mud Hens and the Detroit Tigers, Aviva, uh, and going to Michigan football games in the afternoon, and University of Toledo football games at night, and and is it any wonder I became a sports journalist with a background like that? But I was so fortunate to have um, my mom and dad being supportive, and especially my dad, as, as Title IX was just getting going. Well, now, as the 50th anniversary approaches of this, uh, I believe, the most important law in our country over the last 50 years, and I realize there's a lot of competition for that title, but I, I, I'd say that 
it, it, I, I would do my best to, to uh, state my case on that and argue that point. Uh, we haven't even begun to see the magic of Title IX, this tidal wave of, of confident, strong women who, um, you know, today's 10 year old who's playing sports doesn't even know that, that girls couldn't play, right? And her mom and dad, of course, grew up with sports. That 10 year old, when she's, when she's uh, 60 years old, 50 years from now, oh my gosh, we will have had woman president after woman president. We will have more than 50 uh, women in the Senate. Uh, we will certainly have more than 50% of the House of Representatives be women and on and on it goes. And I think the, the, the logical reason for all of this will be because of Title IX and teaching our daughters all of these wonderful life lessons through sports. Um, not that I'm a big fan of Title IX or anything, but um, for me, it allowed me to have the confidence. I'm 5'11 and a half. I'm, you know, I was tall and strong and, you know, felt obviously was taken seriously early on, which was very lucky for me and my parents, the way they raised me. And um, who knew that when my dad said, stand up straight, shoulders back, Aviva, uh, who knew that he was preparing me to walk into men's locker rooms? And uh, certainly chief among them was covering the Washington football team back when it wasn't called the Washington football team, but I'm so glad that name is gone. And I, I said it so often, and it's embarrassing that we all did back then, but uh, when I covered the football team and they actually won games and uh, won Super Bowls, uh, the Joe Gibbs era, thanks to, of course, the wonderful and, and uh, sports editor and, and dear friend of mine and someone who was a mentor, friend, and, and just so instrumental in my career, George Solomon, who was the sports editor of the Washington Post and hired me, brought me here to D.C. in 84 and, uh, and put me right on the beat. And I covered those teams in 85, 86, and 87. And it was unusual, just to kind of close uh, right now, it was, certainly was unusual for a woman. I was the first woman to cover, cover that team, the Washington football team. And uh, that was when the locker rooms then were open. Uh, equal access was mandated by the commissioner of the National Football League, Pete Rozell, in the fall of 85, summer of 85. George went up to talk to Pete Rozell, other sports editors did. Uh, these wonderful men like George who uh, hired women and encouraged us and gave us these huge jobs and then defended us and were there with us standing side by side every step of the way. How lucky was I uh, to have that at, here in Washington at the Miami Herald before that and now, of course, USA Today. And uh, then at that point, uh, there was equal access. So every, every male reporter and every female reporter had to be treated the exact same way. And that was right as I was being put on the beat. And we never were told that was because the Post was putting a woman on the beat, but it certainly seemed to be a coincidence. And, uh, and if it was, that's, that's fine. Whatever the case, the important thing was equality. And that's, my goodness, how many years ago now? 36 um, years ago. And, um, and women are doing their jobs every day. And there are well over a thousand women now covering sports in our country. Uh, and again, those women who grew up playing sports, wanting careers in sports, sports medicine, sports administration, sports law, running teams, and of course, sports media. And that's why we see such a huge influx of young women who are, I, I'm honored to mentor and have some scholarships and, and uh, fellowships to encourage them. And now they're coming and it's just fantastic to see the numbers. Um, so it's great to see, and I'm honored to still be able to do it all these years later. You want me to weigh in now, Aviva? Uh, yeah, I think you could talk about politics, both in D.C. I, I know you and you have a, uh, a Jack uh, Ken Cook <laughs> Ken Cook story. Yeah, uh, my and role in politics. Uh, sports. And what's happening in New York right now? The governor, and it's sort of been happening in New York the last twenty years. Or I don't know, fifteen years. So, anything you want to talk about this sexism and the advancements in politics? Well, I've certainly seen a lot of advancements. It's great to be on this panel with Christine. Uh, that's uh, She's had quite, and always continues to have quite a remarkable career. Um, I, I, uh, I was, had a good a father who nurtured me as well. He didn't have any sons. I think that's how I managed to get that advantage. One of the things he did do, we did do after dinner would go out and play catch. And, you know, I loved baseball. Uh, but I wasn't, you know, I was shortstop. I, was, I didn't have enough height and ability, but I loved it. And the great thing about it, I, you know, when you started talking is that it does teach you about team, you know, how to play on a team and to be able to, and to enjoy a situation 
I, that's one thing I liked about corporate America. I, and I, one thing I enjoyed, uh, not always, but enjoyed in government, because a variety of people with a variety of talents can come together to achieve a goal. And I think it's very rewarding to have that. Quite frankly, when Title IX was enacted, a lot of people got excited about it. I was happy for it, but I had no idea what a seminal event that was, how transformative it was, and how suddenly we see women who are moving into such pivotal positions. I, one that would never think that a, a, a team of women would ever get the attention and be able to generate the revenue. You know, I used to try to play at tennis and a friend of mine was very close with Pauline Addy Betts who had been um, a US Open. She won the US Open, I think, in Wimbledon. And of course she told me the kindest thing I could do is not to mention she ever tried to teach me tennis. But, <laughs> but what I did discover was, you know, what the purse was like for women. It was almost non-existent. Uh, and that was true, you know, women couldn't earn a living uh, in these, if they wanted to pursue a career in sports because they're considered such irrelevancies. And I think that is the point here uh, regarding potty parity or whatever it might be. We're sort of an afterthought. We who are better than 50% of the population, almost in any category are considered an irrelevancy. In the wake of the Anita Hill, um, you know, dynamic, uh, a historic number of women were elected to the Senate. And of course, it really were, weren't that many, but it was historic at the time. And George Mitchell, who was then majority leader, and I'd known him for years through the Democratic National Committee, invited me up uh, when they, you know, had the uh, oath of office administered to the women. And the big issue was, yeah, there was no, there was no party for the all these women senators. Um, because again, uh, we're so, sort of considered an irrelevancy. Um, and I think what is exciting now is that women are becoming less patient with it and more demanding. And I see it in my daughters and my now I have granddaughters. Um, there is a different kind of expectation, in part because of the women who are dominant in places such as the Serena Williams, or you have women who, such as the Nancy Pelosi, you have these images and women are asserting uh, more power and demanding more parity. But we are a long ways from it. You know, we've come a great distance and I've lived long enough to see that distance that we've traveled. Because, you know, we would, when there was a women's caucus and we got excited. I'm old enough to remember when Betty Friedan came in and we were just absolutely ecstatic that she was there. Uh, but we're still we're still pushing for it. We're over 50% of the population and we're excited about 25% of representation in the House of Representatives and the Congress. It's really absurd. Now, I mean, it's good that we're making progress, but we still have a great distance to go. So, uh, the good thing about what you're doing here, Aviva, is that you know I'm, I was I became a, uh, asked to testify on this issue by Congressman Townsend because his wife was so annoyed that every time she went to an event, she had to stand in a longer queue than <laughs> any man because there was always an absence of there was not potty parity. You know, it was absurd, and we won't go into all of it, but generally uh, it's a little bit more of a logistical challenge for women. So. You think of it; it's 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 kind of crazy. So, I think it's important that we raise these issues. It's absurd that they are still issues, um, but it's good to bring a bright light to them. And of course, you always do things with such flair and flourish. I've known Aviva for quite a while, and she always does it with great flair and flourish. And God bless Abigail Adams; she admonished them, as you pointed out, but nobody paid attention. And here we are, 2021, still making, make, trying to make the point. Yeah, uh, truth be told, many years ago, Sharon was my civil procedure teacher. <laughs> but thanks to the DC bar, I went into filmmaking. So <laughs> let, me, let me pose some questions between us. And I think, by the way, my brother is listening. My father taught 
my brother and I to love baseball. I never could play. I'm a klutz. I can dance very well or too crazy, according to my nieces, but I cannot do any sport. However, my brother would take his three nieces every Saturday to three different games. And then when my second oldest niece, who now is in politics, was at University of Michigan, he went to all of her lacrosse games. And I think you're right, Christine, laying out what sports does for people, but I think also watching it makes you appreciate um, the importance of sport in society. But what I would like to know from the two of you is the Jack uh, Kent Cook story. Now, I think Sharon's, your story has to do with the fact why we didn't have the football team in Washington. I'm not sure what your story is, Christine. Well, uh, you know, uh you know, my father was a season ticket holder for the, the team. And it was, nobody did anything on Sunday when they there was a game. Uh, and I, I kind of liked the Over the Hill gang. It was the gang, the team of what I liked, the Billy Kilmer and Sonny Jurgis team uh, and Larry Brown, you know, and Charlie Taylor. Um, and, but once I met Jack and Cook, I was a little less enthusiastic about all of them. Um, the reality is the truth be told and is that uh, Jack, Jack Kim Cook wanted to expand the RFK stadium. It was very easy to blame the problem on a woman and Diane Feinstein, who had been through the same dynamic when she was mayor of San Francisco, pulled me aside and said, you know, Sharon, try not to let this one blow up because they'll blame it on you as a woman. And he put it on me when in fact, the real issue was he needed the Congress and the Department of Interior because that was on federal land. And so, but it was so much easier to blame it on this woman who wouldn't know up from down because after all, she's a woman and she wouldn't be able to grasp the significance of football. Um, and, uh, you know, John Wilson said that he was a lot more solicitous of me than he'd ever been of anybody else. And he did have us over to his home uh, and they had, um, you know, the tea sandwiches, but they also had the little statuettes outside of the little black livery boys <laughs> also. So he was a, a, a real expression of contradictions. Uh, but the real moment that people remembered is when he thought we had a deal uh, he grabbed me and patted me on the rear. And uh, he probably thought it was perfectly okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, but I, di I didn't hit him, but I did push him. But that's who he was. He was a piece of work. And Christine? Absolutely. Piece of work is the perfect way to describe him, Sharon. And I remember those days and you handled yourself beautifully in a, in a, a very difficult situation. And uh, while he was patting you, he was also patting me, but on the head. And, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm tall. I'm almost six feet tall. And uh, he's not, he was not six feet tall. He's not almost six feet tall. He was short. And so for him to reach up and pat me on the head actually required a lot of uh, dexterity on his part and it, he had to get on his tiptoes. And where was this going on? Well, this would be out at the park uh, near Dulles Airport, the, the old location where they used to be um, south of uh, what was, well, the uh, Dulles Toll Road was being built at this time. And the Dulles Access Road was there. And so it was about a mile south of that right near the airport. And um, he'd come to practice with his then wife, uh, Suzanne Martin, uh, and uh, they would be there and uh, occasionally all the journalists and there, there'd be always be four or five of us there, a couple of the TV stations, people, Frank Herzog, um, George Michael, myself, you had the Washington Times, you had the Baltimore Sun. Uh, some days I was there pretty much by myself because I was there every day. I was a you know the beat writer all the time, every day for three years. Um, but but every now and then, you know, usually I'd have a, there'd be other people with me. We there'd be a little gaggle as you see with politicians, and we'd gather around and and of course I asked a question or two. There were always pressing issues about would they sign Dave Butts? You know, here's some names from the past. Would they be signing John Riggins? Uh, what were they going to do about Joe Theismann after he broke his leg? It was an absolutely fascinating, pivotal time in the history of this incredibly popular team in this city. And, um, and I was there to chronicle every bit of it for the newspaper of my dreams, the Washington Post. 
And, you know, ultimate, just oh, how lucky was I to have this opportunity? It was a lot of hard work, but it was just a joy and, and actually shaped my career and my life. So I'd ask a question and, and Jack Kent Cook would kind of look over and look up at me and my dear girl, and, and so he would answer it kind of. And sometimes he'd lean over, you know, reach up and pat me on the head. And now he would say, my dear boy to the men. So, okay. Um, but uh, he wouldn't pat them on the head, uh, Sharon, clearly he, he was doing this only to the women. Um, you know what, back then, this was 85, as I mentioned, 85, 86 and 87, you just took it. You know what I mean? I just was like, you know, roll my eyes or something. And uh, one, I did say once, I said, Mr. Cook, you don't have to pat me on the head. And, and then it stopped relatively quickly. Now, of course, this would be a huge issue. And if any younger person is listening or any parent of a younger person who's is subjected to this in the worst workplace, of course, completely unacceptable in 2021. But this wasn't 2021. This was 1985. I never told George. I never told Ben Bradley. I never told Catherine Graham. I mean, they wouldn't want to you know, hear about it. I, I, you just you laughed it off. You shrugged and you moved on. That's what we, we women did. And for those um, maybe on, the, on our um, call here on, at, uh, on the Zoom, you know, you're probably nodding your head because you live through these kinds of things in the workplace as well. And so anyway, um, I will say, though, that he also encouraged me to call him at any time. He gave me his home number. There were no cell numbers back then, of course. And, he, and I could. And I could ask him questions about the team. And we could be off the record or on the record. And I will leave the off the record things always off the record, even though he's long since passed away. But suffice it to say, I did get his respect. Um, he did treat me seriously. He certainly was helpful to a journalist covering the team. And, um, and if, was there sexism going on? Sure. Was, uh, you know, could he be as eccentric and bizarre, a self-made man, right? Selling encyclopedias out of the back of his, his uh, car in uh, Ont Ontario and Canada. That's how he started. Of course he could be, but he also knew how to lead. I will give, uh, I will kind of end on this, this point, uh, Viva, that when he hired Joe Gibbs and he hired Bobby Bethard. And in a, in a such a departure from what we see now with Dan Snyder, uh, Jack Ken Cook understood, I'm hiring them, I'm gonna let them do their jobs. And he did not meddle. And when you hire the best, Joe Gibbs, you can argue is the greatest coach who ever lived. Three Super Bowls with three different quarterbacks, not a, he won three Super Bowls with three different quarterbacks, not a one of whom would ever make the Hall of Fame. No coach has ever done that. Not Bill Walsh, Walsh not Vince Lombardi, only Joe Gibbs. And, um, and then of course, Bobby Beathard, the general manager, one of the greats of all time. And Cook just, you know, he, he had these two gems and he let them do their jobs. And the results are there for the history books. And so uh, Cook, Cook was, um, when I think of Snyder and what's, what has happened with the team and the meddling of Dan Snyder, not to mention the very serious issues of sexual assault and sexual harassment. Um, I guess more sexual uh, harassment involving the team and the, and the cheerleaders. Um, it's, it's certainly, um, you can see the leadership of Jack Ken Cook and his knowledge and his savvy and his ability to understand how to lead and how to get out of the way. Uh, something that Dan, Dan Snyder, of course, has never, never seemingly learned. Uh, last thing on Jack Ken Cook, he used to say, if I die, all the time, Aviva, if I die, he would say. Well, the most shocked man on the planet on that, I think it was April day in 19, uh, so 1987, 97, I forget exactly when he died. The most shocked man that day was Jack Ken Cook because he died. Uh, so the if I die uh, guy, um, you know, as opposed to when I die, uh, I kind of got a, always got a kick out of that uh, with Jack Ken Cook. So um, anyway, but uh, fascinating character and obviously a flawed person, but also an incredibly successful person. Yeah, I want to bring up a couple other things. Now, Hollywood is not, uh, the subject of tonight, but it's really exciting about how more female directors are getting recognized, getting better qual uh, quality films. In terms of docs, we've always been 50%, and I have always said that, that that's because uh, the budgets are smaller, but at least that's happening. But you might, we, uh, I'd love, Sharon, if you would mention how um, brave your daughter was and the documentary that she was in this past year that not everyone may have seen. And then I want to get into something about politics. And then we'll open it to questions. Okay, so Drew is one of the protagonists um, in the documentary on the record, Amy Ziering and um, Dick Kirby. Does I have it right? Um, right. Um, 
Um, and it was uh, very well received and recognized at Sundance, HBO Max distributed it. Uh, and it's the story uh, of uh, sexual harassment, principally of Russell Simmons. And my daughter was a Stanford grad who just always had a, this vision of going into the hip hop, you know, world. And as an a and person, artist and repertoire, and um, she wrote a thesis on it when she was at Stanford. And, you know, not all of us got it, but uh, <laughs> at any rate, she did. She managed to work her way uh, to uh, Def Jam. Um, I was never too fond of Russell or Def Jam, but, uh, but at any rate, uh, she had, uh, she, she produced some great uh, sh uh, uh, music. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, she helped them produce some real winning, uh, uh, I call them records that dates me, but uh, at any rate, but ultimately he all but pushed her out of that industry with his sexual harassment. But she did have some good years with Clive Davis uh, and she's the one who got um, um, uh, uh, Aretha to sing uh, Rose is Not a Rose. Uh, um, and now I'm, I, now I can't think of the young woman's name who is the uh, composer of it. But at any rate, it's a very well done documentary. And Aviva and I were seated together at Sundance when they uh, when they uh, screened it. So uh, it's been very well received and recognized. And so I'm proud of her. She's a survivor. But Russell Simmons was actually charged more than sexual harassment. It was rape. And he's sitting there in Tahiti, which you know has no jurisdiction, you know, just living safely. So that that's another whole story in terms of that. So let's go to another issue with politics. New York State right now, the governor is being accused by several accusers. And we have a history of Wiener, Spencer, Schneiderman, and Como, and now the governor. And what's happening? I mean, is it that New York is, that they're worse there? or New York is more conscious about it, or we're all more conscious. I mean, this is just incredible. I mean, do you think we always had that in politics and there's just, you know, more courageous women coming out and why did Trump get away with it? And, you know, these are all held accountable. Now that is one of the differences at, you know, Franken resigns, but uh, Trump never thinks he should. Um, I mean, you know, Cuomo, who was terrific at the beginning of the pandemic, without a doubt, I mean, he certainly was a source of comfort to many of us, uh, has always had a challenging personality. And I think people who, you know, it's not really as much about often as, it, as, as sexual as it is, it is an abuse of power. Oh. I mean, that's really what it's about. It's an abuse of power. Uh, and when you have a position of power, unfortunately, depending upon the character of the individual as to whether you will be deferential and considerate of others, or whether you think you have license to do whatever the heck you want. Uh, and you almost, and the difference now is that women are speaking up and drawing a line in a way that as uh, Christine spoke of it, there were things you had to navigate. Um, you know, certainly when I was coming along that you had to navigate. Uh, but now women are saying, no, I don't have to deal with that. I shouldn't have to deal with that, even in terms of improper language or anything that is inappropriate that makes you uncomfortable. There was no way that we could have done that. There's yeah. just no way. And I think that's part of it, uh, that women feel more empowered. Why we particularly have had a problem in New York, I really don't know. Um, it could be in other communities it's happening and women just don't feel as empowered as do the women uh, in New York. But uh, it, is a, it is an abuse of power more than it is anything else. You know, it's interesting in developing this new website. Uh, so uh, several of the women who worked with me and it's too long to go into all their names and did such a great job are young and uh, young students at Maryland. And it's just so interesting. They just get it right away. I mean, I didn't have to explain anything because they've been brought up in this new atmosphere and it's just wonderful to see. And I don't think men are gonna get away with it anymore. And, you know, and both in terms of what women can achieve 
and what you know men aren't allowed to do. Now I have one Q and A question I'm going to ask. Can Christine comment uh, more on the Washington Football cheerleader situation? Sure, absolutely. Well, the Washington Post has done a terrific job uh, working on this story and breaking it. I've written a couple of columns, Aviva, uh, off of the reporting. And uh, in both of them, I think, certainly one of the two, I have said that, you know, Dan Snyder can't survive this if he knew or if he participated. And uh, as, as we know, there's an investigation. Uh, the NFL uh, had the, re- suppose there, there are stories out there. I saw on Twitter, people said the results are out and, and it's terrible. And then the NFL saying, no, 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 the results are not out. And so uh, I was busy with this certain golfer driving uh, off the road a week or two ago. And uh, then a then the continuing saga of sexual uh, assault in the Olympic sports with the, the story of uh, the, the latest gymnastics coach uh, with uh, uh, two dozen felony counts and then he uh, died by suicide, um, took his life a, a few hours later. So it's been, I've been busy kind of focused on a, a, those kinds of things. Um, but so I haven't focused completely on, on the issue with the Washington football team. But if Dan Snyder knew, I, I can't imagine how he can survive as the owner. Uh, and if Dan Snyder uh, participated, uh, which was one of the allegations that he was actually uh, sending a, a woman up to uh, a hotel room to meet with a, a friend, you know, one of his friends um, for, I guess, well, we can all guess what that was about and um, knew about this and was and, and acted in a, in a bad way. These are allegations that uh, the Post, of course, has reported extensive reporting with uh, many, many women speaking out, some of them anonymous, understandably so, and some of them with their names. So you might ask, how is it that you get rid of an owner, right? (laughs) Because it's one thing that you can fire a coach, fire a manager, fire a player, get rid of them, cut them. Uh, An owner, you don't really, you know, cut the owner. (laughs) Uh, uh, But there are a couple examples. Uh, Donald Sterling was the uh, owner of the LA Clippers. Uh, significant race, racist charges, racial, uh, 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 you know, issues with him and, and comments, uh, racist comments. And, um, and uh, he, was, um, he was relieved of his ownership uh, by the NBA, by Adam Silver. In fact, one of the first things Adam Silver did when he became the commissioner several years ago. So the, it happened in the NBA with the owner of the LA Clippers who was told he had to go and sell his team. And he did, and he is gone. And then in the NFL, it has actually happened. Jerry Richardson was the owner of the Carolina Panthers. And he also uh, was a participant in the abhorrent behavior of sexual harassment. Uh, You would think, I mean, we're not there yet, but we're getting, you know, hopefully more awareness as these older men who somehow don't understand uh, their behavior, how offensive and awful it is. Um, as they are, will be gone, as they will, you know, leave uh, these jobs and uh, and retire and, and move along in their lives, uh, and are replaced by younger men, Title IX males, I call them, uh, <laughs> young men who grew up with their going to their sisters' games, just like their sisters went to their games. Whereas a generation earlier, mom and dad would never have said to the brother, "You got to go and watch your sister play a sport." The brother wouldn't want to be caught dead in the stands watching a woman's a girl's sporting event in high school. And now, um, you know, the coolest girls uh, in high school are the are the athletes. The homecoming queen is also the captain of the basketball team, and it wasn't happening, you know, 50, 30, 40 years ago. And um, you know, so you know, those are the that's you know really where we are with. Um, with sports, and you know, I think going back to Snyder and um, and what what can happen and what should happen. Um, if you think about Jerry Richardson and the fact that he would say, you know, these awful things. In this case, he was talking about how women looked in their blue jeans on Casual Friday and other things like that. It not as I'm not in the business of Eva of ranking um, sexual harassment and by you know what's worse or better. It's all terrible. Of course, sexual assault is awful and despicable and unacceptable. It should be unacceptable in our society. Um, But Richardson, the owner then of the the Panthers, uh, was um, saying awful things, sexist things, harassing things, untoward things, just unacceptable things. And he was encouraged to sell his team, the Carolina Panthers, and he did. So there are two examples of owners who were forced out. And I think Dan Snyder would have to become the third 
if in fact this, uh, the investigation uh, finds that these allegations are true. Yeah, but then was it the Mets manager that was just that, that you know, this whole question is, do they know before what he was doing with these, I don't know, understand this thing with men texting their body parts and that someone pointed out in our group, Connie Cooper Smith, that it was like sending priests to other locations. Anyhow, yeah. there's one question that's being asked, I think for me, and that's the great uh, Sheila Nevins, who's one of the best executive producers in the doc world. She was wonderful in getting Hank Greenberg on HBO and she's now on MTV. And the most devastating film I've seen this year is Hunger Ward about how these kids are being starved in Yemen. Her question is, when will Pissed Off be ready? And there's two considerations there. One is still raising the money, but the second is, and in case you haven't read the news, right now it's very hard to get into Congress, both because of COVID and because of course what happened on January 6th. So as soon as I raise the money and I'm able to go in, there's all these wonderful Congresswomen I wanna interview and other people who may have stories. But there is another question for you. And this I think is the most fascinating one is are there any sports you think that women can play successfully? You know, there was a wonderful TV series that only lasted a season where there was a female pitcher and it didn't last. And I just wonder, you know, what either one of you might think if there's any sport. I mean, I guess we can have women playing tennis pretty easily, but, you know, we're talking about team sports. Well, is, is the question, is the idea that could women compete with men on the yeah. field? Of yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 you know, it certainly happens. It happens in horse racing with jockeys. Uh, it happens um, in uh, equestrian events at the Olympics, for sure. There's mixed doubles, you know, in tennis. Um, you it's going to be car racing. It's on our website today. There's going to be an all women's team in the next big car race. Oh, sure. Danica Patrick, you know, obviously almost won the Daytona 500 a few years ago. And uh, Janet Guthrie and Lynn St. James, uh, IndyCar drivers, um, unfortunately, there. Sexism has reared its ugly head because women uh, drivers, you need so much money. You need a whole team around you, of course. You need the best car, the best, the best pit crew. And, and sexism always played a role in, the, in women having a tough time getting the money, the funding, the corporate support. Um, all, one would hope that now corporations would say, yes, let's, let's really throw our money into these women drivers um, because they will be cheered uh, and supported it by a world that where we have a woman vice president and obviously uh, doing so many amazing things with women in our culture and, and leadership and, and uh, role models. So, so um, yes, now uh, one thought was always that the marathon, that women could drop their times in the marathon, the, the, you know, the running, uh, the race, 26.2 miles and compete with men. Certainly you see many, many women beating men in marathons, be they right. the, the weekend warriors or the, you know, the, uh, the top, the wheelchair uh, entrants are fantastic and, and often beat uh, their male competitors. But in general, we have decided as a society that we would like to see uh, men's sports and women's sports be separate. And I think that's the right way to go. I don't think we need to watch Serena Williams try to play against or any of their Naomi Osaka play against the men. We don't want to see that. Uh, I don't, we don't want to see the women's soccer team play against the men's soccer team. Um, that's why women's sports is protected, you know, as a, as a class in and of itself. We have decided that we want that. Uh, but throughout high school, certainly you see girls wrestling uh, on the boys team because the school district doesn't have a girls wrestling team. You know, if they don't have the team, they have to allow the girls on the boys team. Uh, we certainly have seen uh, Sarah Fuller, the, the, the Vanderbilt uh, soccer player, pressed into action and, and kicked uh, the extra point in the Vanderbilt football game. And obviously became such a hero. She actually participated in Joe uh, Biden's and, and Kamala Harris's inaugural celebration. Uh, so, you know, I think women, as I said, today is the greatest day for women athletes until tomorrow. I mean, it's just, it's just a fantastic time. Women will be the stars of the Olympics this summer. We will have an Olympics this summer in Tokyo. Uh, absolutely guaranteed. There's too much money in it not to, it will look very different, but it will be the first big worldwide event uh, of the, you know, with the pandemic, obviously, hopefully, with vaccines and whatever, hopefully we're headed to uh, a much better place. And the two stars by far, the two biggest names going into that Olympics for the United States and really the world. Uh, Simone Biles, the gymnast and Katie Ledecky, of course, the swimmer who yeah. from 
Bethesda and uh, just right over the line in Bethesda. So that's, uh, you know, women's sports are, are here to stay in a huge way. But I think there are some sports that are conducive to having uh, boys and girls playing together, men and women playing together. Uh, but in general, I, I'm a big fan of the separate opportunities because we certainly want girls and women's sports to succeed and not be just just eaten up, you know, by by men who would generally be vis-a-vis -vis male female elite athlete. The male would generally be bigger and stronger and faster. Again, elite athlete to elite athlete, apples to apples. And so we have determined we want to see women have their own category for sports. And obviously it is hugely successful and popular soccer uh, and so many other sports, uh, basketball, volleyball, et cetera. Sharon, now this is a question, um, and I don't know, maybe either one of you can answer it. You know, Spitzer was found, um, he found out that he was visiting prof prostitutes and that ruined his, his career. The question is Kraft supposedly was also, well, he was a massage parlor, and but yet he's able to keep his team. I mean, I, I don't know if it's apples and oranges, if you can compare it, you know, what scandal is bigger than the other scandal, which sport is more tolerant? I don't know if either one of you, it's just one of the questions either one of you want I mean, to. Is to as to who can survive something and who won't. Yeah. Well, I think people who are also impervious to, or have no sense of sensibility to any of these issues can survive it. I mean, Trump is the perfect example. He could really care less. And he appeals to a swath of the American populace that also could care less. I mean, that was clear with 74 million people supporting him after everything that he had done he still got 74 million people to support him. And, you know, surprisingly, a majority of women, not, I don't think educated women, but still supported Trump. And so I think if you have no sens sensibilities to these issues and you have, and there's still a constituency out here who shares that point of view, then you can ignore it. But if you are dependent upon people who do have sensibilities in these areas. And that may explain why often Democrats may fall, you know, victim or not victim, but uh, are appropriately, you know, sanctioned in a way that others may not. It's because they're very dependent upon a much more progressive type of vote. Well, that's Senator type Franken. Of voter. That's Senator Franken. Yeah, Frank, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Whereas, uh, I mean, look at all the women who came forward with Trump. And they caught him on tape. I mean, it wasn't even like a debatable point, uh, but yet it didn't in any way affect his vote. Um, and so I, I do think we have to acknowledge that, uh, I mean, as a lawyer, you know, we know that the best way to acquit a man on these kinds of, these kind of charges is all, it used to be to get women in the jury because right. women would be so not judgmental of man, but judgmental of the woman who was the victim as to how she invited this inappropriate behavior. Almost always it was a judgment of the woman. The woman would have to prove that she was a saint for them to believe that she had been a, you know, a victim. All that to say, yes, uh, women have come some distance, but we still have a distance to go. And that's why someone like Kraft and Trump can get away with it. But, you know, why don't we end for you on this question? The, there was the question is how we get more women in Congress. And part of that was, and what do we do about Re Representative Green, you know, the one who totes the gun and a lot of hate? Well, I mean, you know, I, happily we did see in the wake of Trump's election, a huge uh, organic response with the Women's March. And then in 2018, historic number of women elected and women who hadn't made a career of seeking office, women who in a moment felt they had to have, wanted their voices heard. Uh, and we need to continue that. We as women tend not to be a monolith. We don't vote necessarily as women. I mean, it, it very much depends upon uh, where you live, ethnicity, education, et cetera. Uh, but women have become it's played a bigger and bigger role over time in terms of a factor in how women vote. Um, 
we just need more women to seek office. Uh, it's always more challenging because women have a harder time raising money and have a harder time being heard. But in this environment where there has been a heightened sensitivity, um, it is a much more welcoming circumstance. What we do about her, I don't know, but to the extent that 45% of the Republicans supported, not Trump, the January 6th insurrection of our government, 45%, we have to, she's not as much of an outlier as we'd like to believe. And so we we're really are on some very um, tenuous soil these in, in America right now. And also the, the increase of anti-Semitism and the attacks on Asians. I mean, my heart just goes out. You have to wonder what is the logic, what is the calculus? I mean, you know, in politics you try to figure out where your votes, but if you're gonna call people from, you know, who are of the Latinx community criminals, you know, we they've always sort of denigrated African Americans. You call it the chi China flu. Uh, you promote anti-Semitism. You're disrespectful to women. You have to think, what is your calculus? How do you think you're going to win? And I think Dana Millibank uh, was perfect, right on point yesterday, and said it would have to be you want an authoritarian form of government. Yeah. You want voter suppression because you're just through with it. You don't want to have to accommodate these this con cacophony of voices. You just want my way or the highway. And there is that dynamic out here. Yeah, well, as a child of a Holocaust survivor born in Berlin, I'm doing everything I can in my films and my political work to change that. And statehood for DC, we could have two uh, more senators. Anything you want to conclude, Christine? And then I have one more thing I have to say before we have to wrap up. No, just uh, what an honor it is to be here talking these issues, of course, with our wonderful mayor, uh, Sharon, again, so great to be on with you. And thank you for your service to our beautiful city and all that you've done. And then, uh, of course, Aviva, my neighbor and friend, we, Aviva and I, I think, have bumped into each other, what, three or four times walking just just by chance, uh, which says we've been doing a lot of walking in the last year, haven't we all? So congratulations on all your incredible and, and is there a way you can sign up to get your columns, Christine? That's a good question. I, I guess there's an alert with uh, USA Today, but my, my Twitter feed is at C Brennan Sports. So first initial, last name, sports, all together. There is someone who already has Christine Brennan and I just feel really sorry for her. <laughs> because there's a lot of people who don't like me. And uh, uh, I think she must be getting a lot of the, uh, bearing the brunt of that. So I would have given up that name a long time ago if I were she, but nonetheless, uh, at C Brennan Sports on Twitter, on Instagram and on Facebook. And Sharon, you just launched a new TV program. Can you just tell us how we can yeah, get- Yeah, we are uh, the, the university, we are the uh, Institute of Politics, Policy and History of which you are part as a resident fellow, uh, Aviva. Uh, we had we started a live stream uh, called State of Play, especially during the election cycle. With uh, originally Michael Steele was a part of it as well, but Karen Fromentano and Reverend Mark Thompson, and we got a following. And so the Black News Channel, which Congressman J. C. Watts started with the owner of the Jaguars, uh, Shad Khan. Uh, so they've been around about since 2020. Uh, we just started Saturday with uh, a program, State of Play, and our first one was about with Dr. Fauci, uh, as well as two prominent African-American physicians battling COVID. So, but I do want to say we've got a real shot at statehood. We have the presidency, we have the House, the challenge in the Senate is the filibuster. But if we could ever get past that, if they abandon the filibuster and or uh, the Republicans get on board because they want Puerto Rico at the same time as the district, but we've got to go for it. We've got a real, real shot. And a lot of people understand now that we have a level of sort of rule by a minority rule in the Senate and in our political system and have full representation for particularly the progressive element in our country. 
uh, which gets ignored. You know, we want gun control. We care about climate change. Nobody, you know, but then again, they do what they want. It's really important statehood and we've got a real shot at it. And it'd be nice, you know, I put it at the end of all my films. It'd be nice to take that off. But so you know, Christine, it's been a joy to be with you. And Aviva, it's always a joy to be with one, you. One more thing. Now, as Sharon said, it's a high, uh, women have a harder time raising money. So I really appreciate it if you would support pissedofffilm.org, go there, tax deductible contribution, and or so, so women. Dot org and eventually we'll be making little videos once we have um, the funding and we're always welcome to hear your stories, your pissed off stories about potty parody and any sports stories. And we're gonna start uh, archiving uh, Christine's uh, notices and stay safe. We still have to wear masks. So uh, as they say, um, next year in uh, the state of what are we going to call Washington, D.C.? It's called the Douglas Commonwealth. Washington, right. the Douglas Commonwealth. From your mouth to the citizens' uh, ears, right? I'm also on the board of D.C. Votes. So thanks a lot. Always to the J. And to everyone all over who are listening. I even have, I think, someone who signed up from Germany. So uh, stay well. And uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks very much. Take care.